Okay, thank you, Layla, and thank you to your team for organizing this really amazing conference. I'm really delighted to be here interviewing Hussein Shalayan today and to explore how fashion fits within the broader scope of the Center for Art, Science, and Technology's mission. Um, when we did the hashtag textile exhibition at the MFA, I have to say we showed mostly contemporary work made within the last few years, but so much of it um, I looked at and I thought, Hussein has been there. He actually had been exploring so many of these technologies and themes quite early on over his 24-year career. Um, so Hussein has been described as a fashion designer, a contemporary artist, a sculptor, a digital architect, fashion's arch avant-gardist, even a mad scientist, but um, ultimately he has said, I'm interested in ideas. Um, Hussein was born in 1970 in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, a place at the crossroads of cultural and religious exchange. He studied at Central St. Martin's in London, and right from the start of his career, um, his work made waves. His 1993 thesis show, called The Tangent Flows, was comprised of silk garments sprinkled with iron filings, which were then buried in his backyard for six months. They were then unearthed, and the decomposition created these random patterns of rust on the pieces. The designs re re uh, revolved around a story he had devised related to life, death, and urban decay. The collection also included a commercial, some commercial pieces. They sold immediately to Brown's department store in London and were featured in their windows. Since that first collection 24 years ago, Hussein has remained true to an interest in storytelling through clothes, and he succeeded in opening up a stimulating fashion dialogue that includes contemporary art practice across disciplines. Hussein was named England's Designer of the Year in 1998 and 2000. He was awarded the MBE in 2006. He's produced art installations at the Venice Biennale and the Istanbul Modern Museum. And he's currently designing for his own Shalayan line and clothing for the French couture house Vionnet. <laughs> Still, or? Yes. Okay. No, it's finished. It's finished. Yeah, okay, he did. He did. Yes. Yeah, I did. He did. Uh, in his own words, what I propose as a designer is to connect gaps in the world. And it's not just the fashion collections that embody this idea, it's his very practice, which is the result of unexpected alliances with mechanical engineers, computer programmers, airplane makers, electrical engineers, furniture makers, the auto industry, um, even Bjork and the special effects team of Harry Potter's Prisoner, Prisoner of Azbakan. And at the center of all this fertile exchange is the dress and the wearer, and a very stimulating dialectic between the conceptual and the wearable, which we will explore in the next 30 or 40 minutes, interweaving our interview with videos and stills from his past collection. So I thought we would perhaps begin. Is there anything I did not get right in your bio? No, it's no? Okay, good. Precise, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I thought we would start with one of my favorite collections of Hussein's, which is from 2007. Um, and it's his 111 collection. Um, and I think it's one of many collections that exhibit this amazing alchemy that's very much rooted in work with multiple disciplines and collaborators. Um, so the collection was described um, by some writers as pure magic and it brought us through 100 years of fashion history. The dresses morphed from a Gibson girl to a flapper to a post-World War II full-skirted ultra-feminine woman to a 1960s shift via microchips embedded in the dresses. So we'll start that so you can see it and then we can talk about it. So I think we can maybe turn down the volume. Um, and anyway, I would love to just chat with you about this. I think it's really this amazing collection, and not only in terms of the collaboration, because there were so many different types of 
um, people involved, but also this idea that you are looking at the fashion cycle itself and kind of that ephemerality and also capturing that in, in the actual work. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to kind of hear you chat about that a bit. Yeah, so for me it was, mm -hmm. um, I think, one of the most challenging projects mm -hmm. um, that I you know, mm -hmm. instigated. Um, and uh, I was really um, interested in how I can create a sense of life for the clothes mm -hmm. uh, so that they could, like you said, mm -hmm. go from one era to another. And um, I started to devise the idea and uh, I approached Swarovski, the crystal mm -hmm. company, because um, you know, I needed a, a, a financier. Mm -hmm. And um, also they said that uh, they wanted to celebrate their 111 years of fashion, mm -hmm. uh, their involvement sort of in, mm -hmm. sort of, let's say, actually it was their 111th uh, anniversary, anniversary, but mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to co coincide that with my project. Mm -hmm. So I decided to call it 111 mm -hmm. for that reason. So I initially looked at 111 years of mm -hmm. fashion. Mm -hmm. And my idea really was about how um, the environment or social change mm -hmm. can uh, influence mm -hmm. the body image. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in, in effect, um, I wanted to kind of demonstrate that with five final looks in the show, which mm -hmm. went from one era to another, but in an abstract way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I approached uh, like uh, mechanical engineers and programmers, um, they had never done anything like that before. Mm -hmm. So it was a big experiment mm -hmm. and a very risky one because there was a lot that could go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we, we wanted, um, again, it's this sort of ongoing concern because mm -hmm. we, I wanted it to be seamless mm -hmm. and for it to not look like you really plonked on the ideas mm -hmm. to the body. So everything was woven through the fabric. And then we used um, the curves of the body to actually um, extend the curves of the body and um, have all the... Um, the motors and the power in there, so you wouldn't see any kind of boxes or anything mm -hmm. um, that would be added on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, one of the amazing things that I find in so much of your work, especially this, it's this contrast between kind of these very fragile materials and then the mechanization, like how difficult that must be to actually achieve in the garment. You know? Definitely. So, I mean, it took really um, almost a year mm -hmm. uh, to get it right. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I had worked on uh, mechanical clothing before, mm -hmm. uh, where, I mean, you will see another piece called the aeroplane dress, which was probably one of the first ones where you had panels mm -hmm. that moved. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess uh, I've been very interested in how you can extend the body mm -hmm. um, and create a new sense of life for the body. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, in a way, it felt very natural to me mm -hmm. to go in that direction, but there were always ramifications of these clothes that you can actually wear as well mm -hmm. that didn't move in the mechanical mm -hmm. way, but mm -hmm. that had a similar shapes or, or mm -hmm. and, and seeming and, and structure. Okay, yeah. yeah. The other thing I found so compelling about the collection itself is that when you think about fashion, you know, it is, there is this kind of idea of death inherent in fashion because the cycle is changing so quickly. Mm -hmm. And in a way, and I feel like you do kind of revisit this notion of that, you know, in many of your collections, this idea of like, the ephemerality of that cycle, especially today in this era of what's called fast fashion. And the mm -hmm. cycle has sped up, I think, even. I'm interested in slow fashion, slow fashion like yeah. slow food. Yes. I <laughs> yeah, think yeah. That I'm interested yeah. in timelessness, really. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yes, it's very hard to describe what that means. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, there are, I guess it's to do with um, being not trend specific, yes. even mm -hmm. though we become part of trends as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's about kind of your approach to the body, mm -hmm. um, but it's not something that I could really pinpoint mm -hmm. what it means mm -hmm. to, to design, design in a timeless way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So I think maybe we can move on to, so now we'll go back a bit in time and look at your airplane dress from 1999. This is probably one of the first uh, kind of mechanized pieces mm -hmm. uh, that I worked on. And um, actually this was in our show mm -hmm. in London. At, mm -hmm. at the time we showed in London, mm -hmm. then we moved to Paris later. Mm -hmm. And um, we presented it like mm -hmm. on a model. And then, th then I did a film with, with. Uh, Marcus Tomlinson mm -hmm. Uh, but with the same soundtrack as I had in the show, in the so, show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, okay, so why don't we play that one?
it. And so um, do you want to talk a little about your collaboration with Marcus Tomlinson and how important, I mean, I do feel like one thing you do so beautifully is address um, fashion and the body from all these different angles. So working with someone like Marcus who can really capture your philosophy, mm -hmm. I think, is you know, yeah, pretty sure. clear in this. Well, I mean, this was um, actually my first exposure to combining fashion with film. Mm -hmm. um, and Marcus was a photographer that mm -hmm. photographed over my work. And he, uh, you know, we, we had this dialogue um, and we made this film. And actually, it was after this that I started mm -hmm. to make my own films uh, because of what I learned. So um, I started to then okay. make films in the early mm -hmm. 2000s mm -hmm. where, you know, then fashion film then wasn't was a known it? thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't really see them as fashion films mm -hmm. anyway. I saw them as, you know, I guess films Pardon where me. I featured clothes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was actually shown in a lot of exhibitions mm -hmm. uh, throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And I just love the purity of it. Mm -hmm. Um, also, um, I wanted to have the model turn in the show mm -hmm. on a turn on a turntable. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it, so when it came to making the film mm -hmm. with Marcus, you know, I said, "Can she turn?" And uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, can we create this new sense of space around mm -hmm. her? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it was uh, definitely one of the first pieces mm -hmm. um, of film using mm -hmm. uh, the clothes. Yeah. And um, that was, we featured that front and center in hashtag textile. It was the opening to the exhibition because yeah. we thought it was such a beautiful, cohesive you know, work in that, in that regard. Um, and I also had read that you were very interested in either becoming um, a pilot or as a child? I, or I was an interested in becoming, yes, I was going yeah. to, I wanted to be a pilot, then I wanted to be an architect, then, mm -hmm. uh, then I wanted to be an actor, all sorts, mm -hmm. you know, it's crazy. <laughs> I think many, but, many children. Yeah, but then actually, um, if, I, if I was to really mm -hmm. start my life again, I would be a musician. Mm. Because, <laughs> because, uh, because I think that that captures, mm -hmm. like, as visual people, I always say it, visual mm -hmm. people are, for me, poor man's musicians. Mm -hmm. I think that we're trying to create the same effect as music, mm -hmm. but yes. we can never do it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, and music is such, and actually the soundtracks to all of your shows and to your films are always a very integral yeah. part of what you're, what you're yeah. trying to achieve. Um, so perhaps we can then have a look at um, Before Minus Now, which followed in the next year. Um, so it's another uh, automated dress. interested when we were here in the earlier session and Kevin Slavin was talking about this idea of mining the invisible and invisible forces that surround us. And I think that this was reacting, right, to these intangible forces mm -hmm. that are in our environment, uh, gravity, weather, tectonic plate movement, radio waves, and mm -hmm. you were responding to that. Yes. Definitely. It, yeah. was, it was about looking at erosion and mm -hmm. how I can um, turn that into form. Mm -hmm. And so these shaved dresses, mm -hmm. um, actually they started as blobs, mm -hmm. which then were shaved into shape. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there were also expanding dresses that were then brought back to the body. Mm -hmm. So you'd have all the pleating that would uh, be needed mm -hmm. uh, to, to shrink it back. Mm -hmm. And then, then looking at the remote control dress, which mm -hmm. was the idea of, again, another mm -hmm. Um, force between the controller and mm -hmm. the actual object. Mm -hmm. So um, I was looking at you know various kind of elements of the invisible and how mm -hmm. that could lead to form. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, again another challenging one at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we used to you know present these uh, collections really very much like performances, mm -hmm. but. In a way, uh, we made such an effort to mm -hmm. make sure the set was right, that mm -hmm. the girl walked out at mm -hmm. the right time, the music was always live. Mm -hmm. It was a big effort. It was, um, yeah. And you know, after that, there's, I don't know if how, how many of you know about fashion, but like mm -hmm. there is um, in the audience, but there's like these fashion calendars mm -hmm. where you have London, Paris, New York, mm -hmm. and Milan as the main cities. And I was feeling that 
London was always being missed because mm -hmm. it was almost too creative mm -hmm. and not commercial enough. Mm -hmm. So I felt like uh, I was making these big, making mm -hmm. a big effort, mm -hmm. and a lot of the uh, the press and the mm -hmm. industry uh, people were. Uh, you know, going straight from New York to, to Milan. Mm -hmm. So then we decided in the year 2000 to start showing in Paris mm -hmm. because I felt like um, I had to grow my business. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then we actually saw a big difference when we moved to collect the collection to Paris. So you did, really, in, yeah. in, in what respect? In terms well, of uh, in terms of a bigger attendance, bigger attendance therefore, yeah. You know, more, more traffic more around. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah. then recently, you just went back to showing in London. Yes. It's a trial. It's a trial. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's great. Um, so why don't we move on? I know we have we have a lot we want to show you in a small amount of time to afterwards. Um, so this one is a collection that um, I think was shown to great acclaim. I mean, a lot of people still refer back to this as one of those very kind of magical fashion moments. Um, and when I was looking at this collection, um, I actually kind of looked back to Orhan Pamuk from the Istanbul-based uh, writer um, who got the Nobel Prize for Literature. And he wrote, um, we live in an age defined by mass migration and creative immigrants. Conrad Nabokov, Naipaul, these are writers known for having managed to migrate between languages, cultures, countries, continents, even civilizations. Their imaginations were fed by exile, a nourishment drawn not through roots, but through rootlessness. And I think that this is a theme that you address in a lot of mm -hmm. your work, yes, mm -hmm. um, especially with the, the um, situation we have currently um, in the refugee crisis. So we can watch this maybe, and then this one's a bit longer, right? We should show this for a little bit. Yes, uh, yeah. I mean, it's the end. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So, so I think. You know, yeah, this I, was uh, actually inspired by um, having to leave your home at the time of war. And uh, Cyprus, where I was born, uh, was war struck uh, in the um, starting in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And I did ask my mother, like, you know, what was the first mm -hmm. uh, thing you thought about mm -hmm. when you had to, you know, leave the house uh, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there was a raid that was imminent. Mm -hmm. And she said the first thing I would take with me would be a blanket, my old photographs, mm -hmm. and maybe food. Mm -hmm. uh, then I thought, well, how could I take this further? Um, and at the time, there was also the, the war in the Balkans that actually refreshed my interest in, uh, you know, in this uh, predicament. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided to turn that, I guess, that horrific feeling into this performance. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this was actually a show uh, with clothes um, that was supposed to be someone's wardrobe. Mm -hmm. And at the end, there was this scenario like you're seeing now. Mm -hmm. And it was about how you can hide your possessions as mm -hmm. chair covers mm -hmm. so they don't get taken. Mm -hmm. And then how you could then turn the, the chairs into suitcases you mm -hmm. can carry them. Mm -hmm. And eventually, how you can turn the table into a skirt so you can you know, mm -hmm. leave with it. But of mm -hmm. course, it's a, it's a sort of a take on the mm -hmm. idea. And, um, and there is a Bul there's Bulgarian singers uh, mm -hmm. live that you can mm -hmm. hear. Mm -hmm. um, singing about uh, war and mm -hmm. um, 
and it was like a prayer at the mm -hmm. back, and I thought it was very moving. We mm -hmm. got them in from Bulgaria at the time. It was very oh. difficult to travel because oh they were still socialists at the time. Oh. Oh, and it was a real like um, experience for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, and that just—I mean—that's what is quite incredible is all these various layers of meaning in your work. And I think that that's one thing that we could talk about this for forty minutes quite easily. <laughs> but um, but we will move on. Um, but um, I also think that there are some interesting parallels that can be made. And I think that's something that you also address in your work is um, this idea that kind of in fashion, we are all migrants as well, because we're constantly kind of reimagining and recreating ourselves through our clothes. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are some interesting you know, parallels with that too. Definitely. You know? Yeah, so, um, but anyway, fantastic. And I mean, how, um, it seems like you do kind of add biographical elements to a lot of your work as well. Yes, I do, be... because why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, I come from mm -hmm. such a mixed background, mm -hmm. and I've experienced so many different things. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, um, I think it's also, um, for a lot of creative people, I think, um, in a way, it's a form of therapy to mm -hmm. do work. Mm -hmm. um, and. I always felt this actually mm -hmm. in whatever area of creativity you're in, mm -hmm. um, you can actually use it to understand the world better mm -hmm. and to make new proposals mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you're exploring and making new proposals at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. And there's a therapeutic element to mm -hmm. it. And if there's also a universal kind of point to it, mm -hmm. then I guess that becomes more like complete. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Great. All right, so I think maybe we can look, oh, so here are some more images of afterwards. And then we can move on to Airborne. So let's have a look at this one. Sure. the hood, the meaning, as well as how this dress relates yes. to that. The, I mean, the whole collection was mm -hmm. about um, connecting uh, the body to mm -hmm. the weather cycles. Mm -hmm. And um, so I divided the collection into mm -hmm. spring, summer, autumn, winter. Mm -hmm. And um, so, one of, so the video dress, for instance, one of them uh, depicted uh, spring mm -hmm. with this opening flower that you can't really mm -hmm. see here. Mm -hmm. And the other one uh, depicted summer with this sort of underwater fish mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and with the hood going over the head, that was autumn. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in a way, I wanted to connect uh, the, nat the, the world's weather cycles mm -hmm. to the body's natural cycles and mm -hmm. create like a new microgeography in a way yeah, uh, by using the body as a, mm -hmm. as a tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you've seen clip it, but there was a whole kind of way of thinking behind it. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I'm a narrative designer mm -hmm. uh, because I think if I have a narrative, I can mm -hmm. really um, create more depth in the clothes and uh, it's very much more of a satisfying way of working for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do see, again, with um, a number of your works, this idea of creating almost um, a refuge, you know, for the body. Yeah. The, that clothing can actually function as that. I mean, I get that sense maybe from the hood, you know, more than some of the others. But it's an ongoing yeah. concern, I think, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, either the clothes have to have that, their own sense of life mm -hmm. or they become a protective layer for the body. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've also worked a little bit with... Um, uh, vehicle design for mm -hmm. this film that I did called Place to Passage, mm -hmm. uh, where we created this vessel that um, kind of become, became a provider for the body, mm -hmm. so to speak. And uh, so, yes, it's an ongoing concern, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to, oh, and the other thing I wanted to uh, point out with the video dress yes. too, which I think was, again, kind of this important moment uh, in 2007, experimenting with this idea of embedding those LEDs yes. in the dress was so novel and so new. And yes. now I feel like we're at a point, like even the exhibition we had, um, where people have kind of taken it and run with it 
But yeah. you know, um, doing this in 2007 must have been remarkably challenging. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because uh, we created every single chip mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, devised a fabric. Mm -hmm. And then it had to also um, show an image. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was really, really challenging because of the amount of pixels we can create in, create mm -hmm. in each pixel. Um, and again, like I had never seen it being done before. Mm -hmm. So um, it would have started around 2006, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and then, because you know, when you see these seasons, mm -hmm. they're always a mm -hmm. year ahead, but actually mm -hmm. you do it the year before. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, the biggest issue I've had throughout my whole mm -hmm. journey is that we make these prototypes mm -hmm. and then I want to turn it into reality. Mm -hmm. I approach people, right. there's never funding, mm -hmm. there's never, like, no one wants to take risks. Mm -hmm. So in a way, um, I think they remain as prototypes they unless do. then, you know, that you have architect, you know, mm -hmm. like architectonic firms that will turn mm -hmm. it into a wall or something. Mm -hmm. Then, right. I guess uh, you you see. Um, I, I, I guess that you know, there's more investment mm -hmm. in um, situations which can have a larger use, mm -hmm. right? Well, and I guess more important use because I don't think fashion is always seen as mm -hmm. um, as important as, let's mm -hmm. say, things that have a broader right. impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. But I do think a lot of that is changing now. And I do feel like we're at a moment where there's this remarkably fertile exchange you know, going on between technology and fashion. And yeah. you know, places like the MIT Media Lab, it's incredible what's happening there. I think you were you know, ahead yeah, of the and, game. And yesterday, and yesterday <laughs> so, I had yeah. a really good visit yeah. um, at, you know, at the Media Lab. And mm -hmm. I was really impressed with the students' work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, fellows work, mm -hmm. I like to think of them as mm -hmm. fellows, mm -hmm. perhaps, and, um, and I was constantly questioning how they can turn their ideas into mm -hmm. business, because I think that one of the problems that I had when I was younger mm -hmm. was I was so interested in ideas, but mm -hmm. I never thought about how I can turn it into business, uh, mm -hmm. and in the last 10, 15 that years, is... it's been much more, you know, the other way, mm -hmm. how I could actually turn ideas into a uh, business that mm -hmm. um, can mean something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so many of your collections always do. I mean, they do kind of, uh, they meld the conceptual and the wearable in some way, right? I mean, you always have a collection that yeah, we sell in, follows the... Yeah, we sell in boutiques and department kind of stores. We have our own store in London. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess there is that duality of museum collectors, art mm -hmm. collectors, right. and then you have mm -hmm. ramifications of those works, mm -hmm. uh, you know, commercially mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to readings. Um, I, this one I thought would be interesting to look at as we're looking at this conference in terms of being material. And this is something that I actually think kind of captures this idea of immateriality in, in the piece itself. So let's take a look at this one. A young girl. It's for seeing each of you here tonight. Which age would you like to live in? Only when it is dark enough can you see the star. So, um, I... I find this fascinating for many levels, um, but I think that you know so much of your work is using this idea, these materials of immateriality. So things like lasers, transparent glass. You did a collection that was made out of sugar glass, right? That was then smashed on the runway. Um, LEDs, videos. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and what that might mean for the piece? Well, readings was about um, the idea of. Um, Sun worship actually, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, so it became this reciprocal, um, uh, let's say, worship where mm -hmm. the lasers refracted back from the mm -hmm. from mirror. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to look at the idea of sun worship, mm -hmm. and then I guess popular worship, mm -hmm. and then the crystals uh, were first lit up like lava, and mm -hmm. then emitted the uh, the laser beams. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then there was a lot of like shapes within the clothes where the lasers came out from. So in a way, that, became, that further accentuated mm -hmm. um, configurations that mm -hmm. um, I couldn't have done otherwise mm -hmm. because of the way that the light would cr um, leak mm -hmm. from certain shapes, let's mm -hmm. say. And um, again, it was uh, actually 
quite difficult project in the sense that um, you know, I hadn't done nothing like it mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And um, we showed it as a film mm -hmm. uh, at Show Studio, and I got mm -hmm. um, Anthony Haggerty Haggerty. from mm -hmm. Anthony and the Johnsons to do the soundtrack. And he responded mm -hmm. actually live, and then we recorded it uh, okay. uh, while we filmed it. Okay. And, um, but it was, yeah, very enjoyable, mm -hmm. but also, um, mm -hmm. you know, again, one of those things mm -hmm. that I, I think I was on this kind of um, journey where I did one project mm -hmm. after another that mm -hmm. felt like necessary for me. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it was mm -hmm. definitely um, nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can imagine, yeah. So I think we still are doing OK for time, right? Or, or should we? We can speed up maybe. Speed up a little bit. bit. Yeah. OK, so let's have a look um, at inertia here. And I think, um, yeah, perhaps we could talk about this a little bit. Um, yeah and not play as much of the soundtrack, yeah. but this idea of kind of the fashion person as this mobile individual and this idea of travel as a state of permanent being, right? Yeah. Is what you're trying to capture in the actual garments themselves? Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was a crash as a result mm -hmm. of speed. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was to capture uh, that moment of, of a crash mm -hmm. um, and freeze that moment, so mm -hmm. to speak. And uh, so we made these dresses that were like uh, from a car crash, mm -hmm. uh, where um, you know I used um, animation really, mm -hmm. and then froze moments, and then um, made molds out of those mm -hmm. after three D printing them. Ah, okay. Um, and um, and then, like I say, mm -hmm. like I said before, mm -hmm. like uh, there were other garments in the collection that. Mm -hmm that was connected to this uh, that you can really wear. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess I want to look at the speed of our lives and, mm -hmm. yeah, the consequent mm -hmm. um, possible mm -hmm. crash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was the material uh, that they were made out it of? It was, the... um, we injected, in, injection molded, um, mm -hmm. essentially, um, I guess it's like um, some kind of polyamide. Uh, okay. And, mm -hmm. um, but it was then, Printed over with, uh, we printed the, we printed the, the images mm -hmm. um, and then actually um, molded it onto mm -hmm. the form. So it was uh, quite I complex, see. and okay. then worked on that as well. So it became mm -hmm. this quite um, um, uh, dense mm -hmm. objects. Mm -hmm. And I, maybe we'll show also a slide. Oops, sorry, a slide here. There's a still, but also this collaboration you did for With Puma, Puma that kind yeah. of captured the same idea. And I think one of the reasons why we wanted to show you this is um, maybe that you know you can then see how a sculptural idea can lead to a mm -hmm. product mm -hmm. that you can really wear. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is called the Swift Shoe. That. Um, that I designed for Puma, because um, I was Puma's creative director for five years. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the pro projects mm -hmm. that uh, we worked on, as well as many other things. But I guess this is a good example mm -hmm. of showing a duality between a fashion show mm -hmm. and what it could lead what to. What it could lead to, yeah. yeah. Um, here's some more uh, shots of the sneakers. And then I know we're running out of time, so we'll maybe have a look at um, Gravity Fatigue, which is a more recent uh, project that you did at Sadler's Wells Theater. It was a. Yes. a so Sadler's Wells is a um, is is I, is the is a dance contemporary dance theatre mm -hmm. in London for those of you who know London, and uh, unusually I was invited mm -hmm. by the head of Sadler's Wells, mm -hmm. Alistair Spaulding, to direct a piece, mm -hmm. which is not some not usual because mm -hmm. I'm yes I'm a designer and an artist, mm -hmm. but I'm not a choreographer, mm -hmm. but I guess I have choreographic ideas, mm -hmm. and uh, this was a two year project which um, I guess. Um, captured my mm -hmm. years of work, mm -hmm. and we will show a piece that mm -hmm. MFA uh, yes. sponsored, sponsored and owns now, mm -hmm. and um, it's called The Possessed Dress, and you will then see our, our clothes, mm -hmm. I guess, within a performance context, mm -hmm. but meaning much more of a, mm -hmm. not performance as a fashion show, but performance mm -hmm. in the theater. Mm -hmm.
So this was just one portion of a tableau. Of, yes, uh, there was many tableaus. Yeah. And uh, it was about being possessed by mm -hmm. the dress. It mm -hmm. was a, um, and then actually the, the performers at the back are almost performing a voodoo on her, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> on the tables mm -hmm. that sink. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was on for four nights and we hope it's going to travel. Oh, fantastic. Uh, but it was yeah. a very uh, long project. It mm -hmm. took, like I said, two years to make, mm -hmm. but so very, very satisfying. I um, can imagine. That must have been such a different medium too, to think about the body moving through dance and then how the dress is actually working in conjunction or separate, you know, from Somehow it. because of the, you're mm -hmm. right, but somehow mm -hmm. because of the work I'd done before, it mm -hmm. came quite naturally, it yeah, yeah. That's great, that's great. Okay, I know we're, we only have a few more minutes and I do wanna show a couple of the more recent <laughs> um, collections, including Paso Tiempo, um, which why don't we have a look and then we can talk about. again with this idea of kind of materiality and immateriality here we have these dresses dissolving um, so what was kind of the concept behind that I was inspired by um, Cuba before it mm -hmm. kind of started to open up mm -hmm. um, it was two years ago we went there and um, I, I wanted to capture the idea of change I mm -hmm. guess and uh, the two models actually stood throughout the show like two guards mm -hmm. And then their uniforms melted and became these dresses. Mm -hmm. And I guess I wanted to capture the idea of water because mm -hmm. it's an island mm -hmm. and change. And uh, I was interested in the female guards mm -hmm. in Cuba as well. Uh, but it was a really enjoyable project mm -hmm. um, in the sense that, uh, again, there was a story mm -hmm. and it was quite timely. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, it was uh, you know, two years ago now that we would have worked on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I think maybe we'll just uh, we have one more. wrap up with uh, Room Tone, which I think is a really, um, another kind of more recent but amazing collection that I, uh, we'll let it go and then we'll just talk about it. When we have a couple. My accessories detect my brain activity and breathing, punctuating how I meditate over flowers, observing their attributes and trying to make a connection as I am feeling distant from nature. The more nervous I am, the less I can focus on the flowers. explain a little of what's going on here. Maybe with we hear the, the next one, yeah. then I can explain. Okay. There's one more little I'll, clip. I'll, is it the next? Yes, yes, there we go. Danger. Okay. Fear of terrorism has become part of my daily life. I am interacting with my accessories, and the more nervous I am, the higher the number, and faster the running legs fill up the space. I am trying to control the fear with my breathing. So the belts are responding, are projecting, yeah, and the, they're responding to the emotion. Yes, yeah, so the exactly. Mm -hmm. So the eyewear detected your brain activity, mm -hmm. and uh, would control uh, the images that would be mm -hmm. emitted from your belt. And there was these uh, actual five different sections. We mm -hmm. only showed you two. Mm -hmm. It was actually about uh, London life. Mm -hmm. uh, I was raised in London, and you know, I consider myself a Londoner, mm -hmm. e despite my ethnic background, mm -hmm. and. Um, and really it was about, uh, like this, was, this one was called uh, imminence of danger, so mm -hmm. the idea of living with terrorism. Mm -hmm. And so you had these legs that were moving around, like mm -hmm. as in running with nervousness, and mm -hmm. depended on, depending on the state, of the, the state of mind of the individual that wore the, mm -hmm. the eyewear, mm -hmm. they would uh, you know, move faster or slower. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, so this was a project that we did with Intel, mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, quite a long process. Mm -hmm. And that right now it's in the Design Museum in London. Uh, um, the new actually, opening, right? sorry, the, the new opening of the Design That's Museum. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and great. it and was really again the idea mm -hmm. of how you can extend, um, mm -hmm. a present, you know, a clothing or an accessory mm -hmm. into something that could, uh, 
engage mm -hmm. with your uh, thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also think it's a great one to end with. We're, fit, we're gonna wrap up because um, I think there's this whole interesting kind of the real versus the virtual and this erasing of kind of these ideas of time and space. And I think that this is what this kind of addresses. It kind of brings fashion into this another type of medium, you know, in many yeah. ways. So, um, yes, yeah, so I know we're a little over time, so we'll wrap it up and uh, thank you all. Thank you, Jason.